Pat yourself on the back because you are right here, right now, for a reason. Welcome to the On Purpose Podcast, where together we will empower ourselves and others to live lives with more passion and purpose. How are you doing this morning, Jared? <sighs> Fantastic, my friend. I'm back in the studio with you. No mask, no six feet. Good to see yeah, you, man. Man, I've been missing you, my friend. So I'm I'm excited to be back and to get ready. You know, Zoom was convenient, but it's just not the same as getting together and sharing an actual legit conversation. Ramadan's over so we can have coffee again. Oh yeah. So life is good. How are you, my friend? Uh, doing well, man. Like you just said, Ramadan's over. I am all the way maxed out, charged up with energy, being able to eat and drink during the day and it was a great month of, of spiritual discipline, fasted from about 4 a.m. to 8 p.m. for 30 days straight. Wow. And and feeling really good and refreshed. Yeah, I, f- I feel bummed because we had talked about it last year. We had shared Ramadan through episode after episode. It was like kind of an update, and I feel like I got cheated <laughs> that, uh, that I didn't get to be part of it this year. You know, because literally all, everything happened right before Ramadan and ended when it was over. Yeah, yeah, we had a couple dinners last year where yeah. you would see me, like, light up after yeah, yeah. dinner. <laughs> well, speaking of that, uh, my youngest daughter the other day was still bugging me to get your mom to make some more of that food you sent home with Oh, us. yeah, and how That funny. was last Ramadan. Oh, nice, yeah. Yeah, hey, I can hook you up, man. <laughs> I, can, I can cook some good food, too. <laughs> yeah, so we're back. We we're, are back. We're back, in person, ready to go. Um, thank you community for joining us and, and being just amazing. Our Patreon is going, uh, very well. So those of you that are new or haven't heard it before, we have a Patreon account set up, um, to where you can actually contribute to support the growth and the funding of the podcast, as well as, uh, different levels. And you can actually take part in it, start, um, submitting guest requis- uh, requests, get surprise gifts every now and then, maybe a coffee mug shows up, but it's just a way to contribute to a podcast that, you know, we're a year and a half old now and we're just continuing to gain steam. And um, many people have asked how they can help, and this is a great way. Yeah, huge way. And our upper tiers actually include a, a monthly call with us as well, more of a coaching call geared towards helping you move towards your goals, move towards your purpose, And we need your help, guys. We really do. We want to take this podcast to the next level. We want to have many more in-person workshops than we've had. We only had that that one last year. Have a few planned for this year. Corona obviously has has switched some things up on us. But we really appreciate your help. All those who have already subscribed to the Patreon page, we really appreciate that. If you get any value from the podcast, please hop on over, subscribe. We have tiers as low as $2 a month up to our top tier at 50 bucks a month, and we really appreciate your support. Yeah. So we thank you. We're back. We're ready to get going. And before we jump into this this next guest, honestly, just reading his bio and all this stuff, I'm like, <laughs> man, I don't, I, I'm kind of nervous to say anything, so I think I'm an idiot. Uh, <laughs> Very well and thoroughly educated man, for sure. But before we get there, I want to say – Thanks to our last guest, Lainey, for coming on, and obviously a, a friend of yours from back in the day. So what did you take away from her story? Yeah, thanks to Lainey. Incredible story. And my biggest takeaway from her, so we went to Winston Churchill High School, and it's ironic because one of, one of Winston Churchill's popular saying and speeches is, is never give up. And he... I feel that Lainey really embodies that never giving up that resilience, that, that story that she told about her first time, uh, not needing her mom and doing everything that yeah. she needed for the shower and, and, uh, never giving up, continuing to accomplish goals despite her setbacks and her persistence and resilience is really what I took away from that story, from her story. Yeah. I, I really, it was a fun interview, and I enjoyed her story. Uh, obviously, you know, tragedy sparks growth, and it sparks change. But I also, I honestly felt that when we are talking to her, she's still coming to grips with her story. 
And I think a lot of us are, right? Like your story isn't just one event and that becomes the definition of your life. Like it's, it's a constant evolution and process. And, and like my story today won't be necessarily the exact same tomorrow. It'll, it'll have morph based off my experience. And just watching her speak during that conversation and listening to her, I, I felt like there was processing taking place and growing within her story taking place. And it was... uh it was very grounding mm -hmm. to just realize like we are all still works in progress. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's an honor to be a part of that continued growth, you know, Lainey helping us grow on our end and us being able to help yeah. her grow through her sharing her story. So thanks again. It was great. Yeah. It was fantastic. And, and you know, make sure you all are commenting, uh, leaving reviews, sharing the podcast, help us grow and continue to, you know, reach out if there's a guest that really resonates with you or a conversation that resonates with you, reach out and follow those people on social, connect with them. One of the best things we can do is bring them into our community beyond just the episode, but really embrace them and let them know the on purpose community is for real. Amen. For real, for real. All right. You ready to bring this guy on? Let's do it. I don't man. even know how to say his name. I'm going to call him Sir a bunch. I looked at his name. I'm like, I'll never pronounce this right. It's Imam Da'i Abdullah. Now, is Imam, is that a name or a title? That's a title. That's like preacher. Okay. Or priest in, priest in Islam. Yeah. Okay. Preacher, yeah. So Imam's his title and Da'i, Da'i, Da'i. Da'i. Da'i is... Mm -hmm. His actual name is his name, which I believe we'll learn more about in in the interview. But he uh, changed his name, I believe, when he converted to Islam. I believe that's his Islamic name. Well, it's gonna be a lot of a uh, lot of good learning from me. I'm gonna have to take some notes on this one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Get ready is a multiple degree holding individual with an incredible global story. So let's bring him on. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very excited to introduce a very special guest that we have with us today, Imam Da'i Abdullah. He was born in Detroit, Michigan, and one of and is one of the first and the few openly gay imams in the entire world who is leading the movement of modern, inclusive Islam. He is a linguist in Chinese and Arabic with his degrees from Georgetown University, and is also a former lawyer getting his JD from the University of the District of Columbia School of Law, and also holds two master's degrees in Sharia law with an emphasis in Quranic interpretation. So we definitely have a lot to learn from Mr. <laughs> Imam Da'i today. Welcome, Mr. Imam Da'i. How are you doing this morning? Very well, thank you. And salam, and thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's a pl uh, privilege to have you on the show, and I am excited to learn more about your story and share it with our community. It's fascinating. That's a great intro. <laughs> yeah, hey. definitely, and great timing. The time of this recording is actually right after the holy month of Ramadan, where over one billion Muslims around the entire world practice observing a month of high discipline with fasting, reading Quran and, and taking their spirituality to the next level. So right in time, Imam Da'i, how was your, how was your Ramadan? It was pretty good. No major complaints. Actually, uh, for the first time in several years, I joined a group of progressive Muslims and did a Quranic reading, uh, each night reading a portion of uh, the Quran. And it was very nice having an opportunity because our group, being inclusive as a Muslim means that men and women, we practice equality, full equality. So we have women who will uh, call the van, lead the groups, and various other aspects, even do the khutbas, things of this nature. So it was really nice to participate with a number of people. And we were from all over the country, the United States. So it was very nice to have this chronic reading and each night having an opportunity to share with each other uh, the readings as we went through. Awesome. That's that's terrific to hear because I know that in, in a lot of Muslim countries, especially what we're shown here in the West, there's not a very strong representation of women leaders. So that's definitely progressive. And I'm glad to hear that. So we have a lot to get into today. Yeah. 
But before we do... We got to warm you up, sir. We don't like to just jump right into the deep, heavy stuff. We like to to warm you up, kind of like a pre-workout stretch. You know, we got to kind of learn a little bit more. So, okay. sit back and get ready. We got some tough ones coming your way here. <laughs> Number one, if you can only have one food for the rest of your life, what are you taking? Oh, fish, of course. <laughs> oh, why fish? Because I love it. Um, I've always been a seafood eater. Um, I actually enjoy the water. I've always found that the water has been very soothing for me. So, and my astrological sign, I'm a Capricorn, so I'm half fish. So, mm-hmm. makes sense. Uh... <laughs> Is there a specific fish? Red snapper, catfish, trout? Well, actually, the one that I like the best is out, uh, out of South Africa. It's called Snook. Mm. And I love it. It's, you know, very bony, but it's just wonderful. It's, it's similar to cod. Okay. Okay. Nice and, and flaky. It has a very nice, it's a flaky, but very nice, sweet flavor to it. Most people, it's considered a, a poor fish, like someone eating mackerel compared mm-hmm. to other fish. But I found it to be wonderful. And you go down there and get some snook and some chips, I'm in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Oh, man. You're making, making me hungry over here, man. I was, I was man. just thinking the same thing. <laughs> Ramadan's over. My hunger's up. That's right. <laughs> and, and, and real quick, is, is it okay if, if, I, if we address you as, as just imam? Yeah, that's fine. Cool. Yeah. Imam. It's it's a little easier than saying Imam Da'ayi every single time I address you. <laughs> yeah, I would get it. <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy with that. And actually, I prefer not to be so formal. Um, so just please. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. No, I, I, I like you, ma'am. I think that might be a little easier for Jared, too, huh? <laughs> the Da'ayi. Yeah. Notice I hadn't even tried it yet. I'm still working up the courage to try it. <laughs> All right. All right, Imam. Next question is if you could be any superhero uh, a fictional character like batman or superman or one that you make up like super daddy who would you be and what would your one superpower be oh wow since i am a comic book fan from way 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 back i mean i remember when the first fantastic four and iron man came out (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think the one uh, that suits me well, I think I would want to be the Black Panther. Oh, nice. Because I think it's important, um, as a Black man, I think it's very important that um, I promote uh, an understanding that connects me to my African history, my African roots, but also that we've always been part of that process of intellectual development which so often is not looked at, particularly in the West, it's always about sports, which is nothing wrong with it. But I think that too often black males are not provided better intellectual persons outside of those out of enslavement, but actually our longer history. But also there's the other side of it too, that I think too much the the idea of people wanting to say that, you know, you come from a lineage of kings and queens, well, that's taking it too far. Because although that may be true for some, it's not for everybody. <laughs> so <laughs> it's important that we recognize that we come from um, very strong roots, the first people in the, in the world, but also that we are, as people, have grown and developed over time. And therefore, we are at a new time and a new way in which we are able to develop into something uniquely different than what we were before. Um, one other thing about that, I always, there's a story, um, the poem of the, the slave mother and the dreams which she has for her children. And I think it's very important that we not forget that enslavement has happened because it's been part of human history throughout. I don't think there's any group that has not dealt with that at some time in history but that the dream of us being able to achieve those things has not come to full fruition. Therefore, like Stevie Wonder said in his album many decades ago, he said, maybe your grandchildren's grandchildren will be able to tell the difference. Mm. So we're on that road, we're on that path. Yeah, I sure hope we are. I think we are. Good. 
then mm-hmm. one last question for you. What book are you currently reading? We like to share our reading list with our audience. Okay. Um, actually, it's one I'm rereading. It's called Reasoning with God, and it's by uh, Dr. Khaled Abu Fadlan. Um, he's the professor of, of law, uh, Islamic law at UCLA uh, School of Law. And he's one of the major Islamic law people that I follow. Uh, the person who was my mentor, and we'll talk about this a little later, but Dr. Taha Jab Alawani, who was head of the US Shura Council, was my mentor for nearly three years. I studied under him. So I got one of my masters with him. And he was a, a well-known Islamic uh, Sharia scholar. And so I considered Dr. Taha, who's now deceased, he's been deceased about three years now, and Dr. El Fadl um, to be on the same state, the same, um, their contemporaries and same quality of understanding in Islamic law. So I love reading his books. Very nice. All right. You feeling warmed up? Oh yeah, no problem. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're I think we're ready to to dive deep into and you know what? I I think I'm just going to say Imam Dai a lot more often than I thought because I just enjoy saying your name. That's a great name. Okay. <laughs> well, actually, if I tell you my name uh came from um a derivative. My Chinese name is Tang Dai. Hmm. And that Tang, which was the, the Tang Dynasty, was a period of great intellectual development in China. We're talking from around 650 to around 950 in that time frame. And oh, then wow. Da has the meaning of big. And then that particular tone E, there's like 54 sounds for E in Chinese, but that particular wow. character is one means virtue. So I'm the peaceful man of great virtue. Love it. The peaceful so, man of great virtue. And so when I went to the Middle East to study Arabic, I, am, I had become Muslim. I was seeking a name comparable. And so I found that the sound da'i, 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 was very similar. And then da'i means the one who proselytizes, the one who brings to the religion. Mm-hmm. And so that shaped my framework. So when I'm in China in the Far East, I have my name, I'm Dai. And then when I'm in the Middle East, I'm Dai. Yeah. So, you know, it all fits well. The puzzle pieces, you know, link together. <laughs> there you go. There you go. They all link together. Well, Imam Dai, we have a lot to get into today. So I'd like to start with who you started out as, your original name, you grew up in Detroit, Michigan, you were raised as a Southern Baptist, and, and it was at the age of eight that you already recognized that that faith wasn't for you. So could you give us, since we have a lot to get into here, can you ke- give us and our listeners a, a brief synopsis of who who you were and, and the transition from the age of eight and then lead us into your adventures to, to China and the Middle East and then we can get in into more of your purpose today. Okay, well, I'll, a brief, um, uh, let's put it very briefly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I come from a family of um, seven boys, one girl. Uh, my sister is the youngest. Uh, both my parents college educated. And uh, my father worked as a postman. My mother had come from a business family. Actually, Madam Walker, I don't know if you're familiar with the hair products, but my grandmother was one of those women who came from that and went to Detroit and established a, a beautician shop and then eventually worked with the funeral home, the black funeral homes there. So that was a way in which they had business. And my mother grew up with car, you know, during the Depression, they had cars and property and things like that. Um, so Growing up in the household, my parents already always emphasized education. So we didn't have to go to the library. We had our own encyclopedia set and, and books and everything all around. So mm-hmm. we, you know, and they, they demanded that we read those things so that we had a background in edu- education for, of our own history before, and didn't depend on the public education system to teach us that. Sure. So 
what had happened is that at eight years old, I had been baptized in the, um, the Southern Baptist faith. And it was at that time, there was a real unique revelation that came to me that there was something not quite right about the faith um, for me. And so I had a conversation with my parents telling them that this just wasn't fitting for me and that I wanted to do something, learn more. And so my parents being who they were, they said, well, it's not the faith that you follow, but that you have something to hold on to because we as human beings at times, because of our failings, that we need something to hold on to. So they allowed me to go with my friends. I had Jewish friends, friends from Far East Asia, um, friends from Mexico, people from all over the world came to Detroit. So I had neighbors and friends I went to school with and that allowed me opportunities to go to other churches and other religious centers. And, to learn and, more and, about them. and this conversation you had at eight years old with your parents? Yes. Wow. Well, my mother told me that at three, I was actually reading and writing at that time and very oh. articulate. And at four, this is a funny thing. At four years old, my mother had a conversation. I remember it so well. She said to me, she said, Sydney, you can't be telling adults that they're wrong. <laughs> and I would bust adults out. They'd be saying, I said, you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you were born Sydney Thompson. Right. And so that's what she, um, she taught me. You know, she said, you have to learn how to um, learn it. So we, we had an agreement that I, I would always, if I was in the converse, in the place with other adults, I would look to her and if she nodded, okay, I would say what I wanted to say. If not, I would mm. be quiet. <laughs> wow. So that, that was part of the thing, but in my learning to grow and understand other parts of the religion, other religions, I had a good friend uh, in elementary school. His father was black, his mother was Korean. Um, and so I had a chance to go to their home a lot. We would play, you know, we would do exchange dates and things like that. And uh, I learned about Buddhism through them because they were practicing Buddhists. So it was through that process I got exposed to Buddhism. Uh, Judaism, I had a good Jewish friend and I would go to his house and on their, their, their holy days, things of this nature, um, I would understand what was going on. I even got invited to the, the synagogue and they, they were Orthodox. Um, Jews, so I got invited to that. Um, various types of Christian backgrounds, and Episcopalian, Evangelical, those things as well. And I still, I didn't find anything. And by, around the time I was ready to graduate from high school, I found metaphysics. And it was there that I found a place where I could sit and better understand myself through metaphysics without a designation of any particular religion, but understanding there was universal law. And it was through that process that allowed me to find a place of peace and connectivity that didn't ha I didn't have to identify. Um, I graduated from high school when I was 15. I was already turned 16. I was going off to college. And I felt it was important that I had my conversation with my parents. Uh, they always had a thing that when you graduate from high school, you would surrender your high school diploma to my father. And then you became your own person, meaning that the decisions you wanted to make about your life, career, and things of this nature was yours. As long as you lived in my parents' home, they had rules and regulations. You abided by that. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. But they allowed me that process. And so at that time, I told them, I said, well, I, I want you all to understand, but I am gay. And this was 1969. The gay movement had just started. And um, there's a little funny story that went on. That summer, there was a, TV, a radio station called W4, and they used to have a morning show, you know, the, the morning uh, commuter drive. Mm -hmm. And they had one skit on where this uh, guy was trying to tell his father he was gay, and the father would refuse to understand. So he would say, We well, you know Dad John and I are good friends. He said, oh, well, that's good to have good friends. We well, you know my business partner. And he said, Oh, yeah, that's good. So every time he would try to tell him that they're, they're a gay couple, his father would ignore that and just <laughs> move it to something else. He's rather humorous. So I say, well, I have to be honest with my parents. They've always said to us that if you're honest with them, they're honest with you. And so through that process, I did. And they told me they didn't see anything wrong with me. I had upheld all the standards that they had held for all of their children. And there was nothing wrong with me. And with that, I felt very comfortable moving forward 
as a man loving man to center my life in such a way without any shaming or feeling that I didn't belong. Mm -hmm. And so that allowed me to move forward without any problems. And when your fam back then in the 1970s, if your family knew, it didn't matter what anybody else said. Right. Yeah. Right. And ma'am, so I, I want to I wanna take a moment to reflect on that because during that time in 1969, like you said, the movement had just started. There was no yeah. social media. The, I'm sure there probably wasn't a lot of people or, or role models, gay role models or mentors that you had around you. When was it that you that you started to take ownership and, and started to realize like, okay, yes, I'm, I'm a gay man. And, and how did you build up the courage to, to tell, to tell your parents and come out as a gay man at such a young age? Well, there were two things. Um, one thing, first, um, in junior high school, I met a boy by the name of Otis and Otis and I developed a relationship and um, junior high school through high school. Um, but he committed suicide in the sen my senior year of school. Um, I'll never know the real reason why, but he lost his mother about a year beforehand and he was close to his mom. So I don't know if that was a part of the, the problem, but also I knew that how people would abuse people who were gay. Mm -hmm. And so it may have been the combination of those things where he felt he couldn't move forward. And then uh, when I was 40, I was showing my mother a picture. Hold on a second, let me get it, I'll show it to you. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see that? Yep. Two little boys. Well, this is a picture, I think the lady's name is Helen Seller. She was a um, photographer in the 1940s in Harlem. And these are some of the photos from that collection. And so it has one little boy on the, on the ground, seated on the curb, another little boy sort of on bended knee, holding his hand like he's proposing. So I was 40 years old. I have come back from overseas, stopped in New York, and I was showing my mom this card I had brought back. And she said, oh, that was you at four years old, always talking about your little boyfriend, who you're going to marry, you're going to be the dad, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Oh, so wow. I think that was something that, indicated to my parents that I, this kid is different. You know? so, yeah. But I think they thought it was probably whimsical child's play. But in reality, it was much me, more me being who I was and it, revealing it. But I learned later as I entered school that you didn't talk about those things. Mm -hmm. People didn't like you talking about those things. So um, I don't know where to continue at. Okay, so after all this, I uh, committed suicide, I went off to college. I was doing well my first year, but I found that I didn't fit in socially. You know, you're 16 years old. The other people there are generally 18 or older. They're smoking weed, having sex, all kinds of things. And I felt socially uncomfortable there. So, um, you know, doing drugs, all of that. So I, I told my parents I wanted to come back home. And then I found a job. I was 17, found a job working and went to school at night. And that allowed me an opportunity to start traveling and going places on my own. And that's how I started my, my venture, my love for travel really got sparked and continued to do so during that time. After uh, several years there finishing school, working a little bit, I decided that I was going to go. One of my um, neighbors, Elaine, had just finished school from um, University of Michigan, um, no, not University, Michigan State University. And she was going to graduate school in San Francisco. She's a psychologist, just retired a few years ago. And um, Elaine was, she was brilliant. She took the SAT in 1968 and she came in number one in the, in the nation. Wow. She had a perfect score of the SAT at that time. So she had like 400 and some offers from different schools to go to, so she wound up as a black young female, mother being a you know a domestic. Uh, she had a, a free free ride, so she moved out to San Francisco to do her internship out there. And I went to visit, and I said I like this place, and I relocated there, which I stayed there for almost five years. Um, had my first male male adult male male relationship there, and then from there. Um, 
I moved back, well, I went to Washington, D.C. in um, 1979 for the first gay and lesbian march on Washington. And it was there that I realized that Washington, D.C. was a black gay mecca. And that's when I relocated there and got involved in um, the gay political movement there. So, and so I, that brought me to Washington, D.C. Yeah, that's, man, fascinating. That's a lot of, lot of stuff to... To track, so I'm curious. So you go to DC, and um, I would just like to know more. How did you kind of reconcile being gay with faith and and working through that at that time? Because um, you know, we I we both have siblings that are uh, gay and have processed different times to come out and stuff. How did you reconcile being openly gay with faith and not? kind of getting pushed away from it because I know a lot of people will, it's, it's not always inclusive. Mm -hmm. So how, well, and, MCC, go ahead. well uh, MCC had gotten started and they had a center there in Detroit, a Christian um, metropolitan community church. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Um, and so um, I started going to the church there in Detroit and uh, they had a black lesbian leader there. And that's who I got uh. to, uh, go and participate. I enjoyed the church services, but also had me an opportunity had an opportunity to learn more about being gay from other people, other adults there, some of them older. And so it was a good place to to do that. And so when I went to San Francisco, they had a center there and I also participated there. Now, one thing I'd say, I met a gentleman by the name of Montford Cardwell. He's deceased now, but he was a wonderful mentor for me there. And um, he was the first black uh, curator for the San Francisco Museum of Arts. He was from New York City. So I always wound up having these great mentors in yeah. so many different places. And he taught me about, as long as, a few, as well as a few others, about maintaining one's dignity of who you are. And so that, that helped me in a number of ways to stay out of the, the quagmire in which many gay people got involved because of the sex, the alcohol, the drugs, all of that. Right. So I didn't get involved in those things and I always maintained the relationship. Uh, the relationships I did have, it was based on me getting to know the person and us becoming a couple and not yeah. really out there, you know, running the streets, so to speak at that, at that time. And, and I, so it, it go ahead. I, I love this. And I, I think it's a great point for our community is, um, that just because you don't do things the same way everybody else does doesn't mean you have to be by yourself, right? Because, okay, so um, your, your path was different than a lot of your peers. It was different than a lot of people around you. But I think it's sometimes when we start doing things differently, it's easy to isolate ourselves or think like there's something wrong with it. Why am I doing this when everybody's doing that? But I love how you constantly sought out mentorship and advice from people that were on a similar path. And I think that's one of the lessons we really try to stress with our community is you don't have to do everything because everybody else is doing it. Be yourself. And when you do that and you accept it, you're going to find that there are many other people, no matter how different you think you are, there's other people doing the same things that you can learn from. So I I love hearing those stories. And what I'm hearing is like constant mentorship and constantly finding somebody that had kind of set a path for you to follow and then you could take the path further. Yeah. Very true. Yeah, and, and, and that's incredible because you were truly a pioneer during that time. You know, in 1979, I think you mentioned that, that was the first gay and lesbian march in, in DC. So that, I mean, the, these are pioneering times. And again, we didn't have social media. We did, we, there wasn't an... A, there really wasn't a way to connect with other people unless you showed up. Yeah, you had to put effort in. Right. right. You couldn't just go Google search a group or find it on Facebook or something. Like you literally had to go out and and really, I mean, honestly, you had to take some risk. Big risk. Right, to say this is who I am because you, you kind of thought you were in the right circle, but you could be rejected easily there. Yeah. Yeah. So, ma'am, I want I want to take this conversation because we have we have a lot to cover here with with everything that you just shared with us. Yep. 
and you had such a robust background of religion in your life from having Jewish friends, growing up Southern Baptist, going to different churches. And, and I'm curious to know, and I'm sure our listeners are too, what was it that led you to the path specifically to Islam? Because in my opinion, from what I know about Islam is it may be one of the least progressive religions currently, Judeo-Christian religions for openly gay and, and lesbian people because it, it, it has a lot of uh, resistance to that. So that would be maybe one of the religions that I would think would be more repelling uh, of gay and lesbian. So please share with us how you how you were led to Islam and, and what truly made you want to convert to become a Muslim. Okay. Well, the story starts like this. I was working as a course stenographer for the IRS and I was at a uh, the IRS, we would usually have two week periods where we would go to a major city. They would do all the tax court cases during that time. And then we would usually go back to our, our uh, base cities and then travel again for two weeks. So it was a, a tax court judge that I had run into and he had been a court stenographer before. And he says, no, you're a bright guy. Um, have you ever considered becoming a lawyer? And we had conversations on and on. And then I said, well, maybe I will do so. But then the question became, what kind of lawyer? So I was feeling, you know, sometimes you feel uncomfortable within your gut. You need to do something different. Yep. And that was building in me. So I decided to quit my job. I had saved a little bit of money. I moved back to Washington, D.C. I had moved from D.C. to Chicago. That's where I was based. And um, I moved back to D.C., stayed with some friends, actually with a sleeping bag, sleeping in one of their empty rooms for a yeah. couple of weeks. And while there... Um, I started to have visions. I was praying and um, I asked our creator for something to do. What can I do with my life that would help other people? And over a, a three-day period, I had two visions. The first vision was that I was in San Francisco at Mount, um, what is it? Mount Tam, which is one of the observer, observation tower uh, centers there. And I was there and I saw the, the storm and the wind, the, you know, everything was in turmoil and then everything calmed down. And I was able to see as far as San Diego and out you know, to the ocean. And so an inner voice spoke to me and said that step off the cliff and I did and I started floating. So that was the end of the first vision. Woke up, I was like, wow, that's strange. Mm -hmm. Two nights later, I had the second part of the vision and the vision said study Chinese study Chinese. <laughs> so I said, okay. And I checked around the different schools there, University of Maryland, George Washington University. And then I went to Georgetown and University of Maryland had part-time programs. GW, they literally looked at me and said, nigga, why do you want to study Chinese? <laughs> they didn't say enough those words, but that's their attitude. Right. And I went to Georgetown and the lady there says, we've been waiting for you. Hmm. And I wound up getting a full scholarship and immediately started studying Chinese. And nine months later, I was at Beijing University hmm. on their you know, year-long program. And it was there that I met Ma, who was um, Hui Chinese. And it was there that we had a conversation. The way the program worked is that you would you know, have your classes in Chinese in the morning and in the afternoon, you could take courses you had interest in. So we were in a history course together. and. Um, Ma asked me one day, he says, well, do you know anything about Islam? And I told him, yeah, NOI, Nation of Islam, because one of my elder brothers had belonged to it. And also I had learned about some of the Wahhabist uh, things that were coming out of Saudi Arabia, the Gulf. And he says, no, 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 the real Islam. And I said, the real Islam sparked my interest. And we started having conversations. About two weeks later, he invited me to go to the mosque, Cow Street Mosque. And it was there they had my first opportunity to go into a real mosque. So although it's a converted pagoda. Mm -hmm. And I went in, uh, he showed me how to do the wudu and everything. And then I went in for the khutbah and the khutbah was being done in Arabic, but I didn't understand Arabic at that time. But when he did it in Chinese, it made perfect sense. Mm. And wow. so I started um, going back and forth about every two weeks or so, I would go for the um, for the chutbah, but also spending time with him and some of the other Muslims. There was a, a Uyghur guy from the from Xinjiang 
who was Uyghur, who we would talk and things like that. And then um, about two months later, Ma gave me my first Quran is in Chinese and Arabic. Oh, cool. And I still have that Quran today. I've um, never seen one so, of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great, it was a great book. It, I mean, it's not, it's a translation. It's more like a, a tefsir for the Arabic. Mm, I got gotcha. you. So, Imam, was there? So, for our listeners, the khutbah, the khutbah is is the sermon for for the Friday prayer, and yes, lecture, you know, sermon lecture. Exactly the the lecture sermon, and and what was it about that first one that you heard in Chinese that you feel m- made sense? Because what fascinates me, and and I love how you said our Creator, right? Because at that time, it seems like you you were praying to to our creator and had so much influence you knew you were in a southern baptist you, you had studied buddhism judaism a little bit about noi and, and different sects of islam but you, you kind of were in this place where you weren't you, you weren't uh nothing made really good sense to you so what what was it about that kutbah that that really made sense to you well it wasn't so much the khutbah per se but it was actually the practice of prayer that made the significant difference. I found over time that the process of prayer, Salat, Mm -hmm. was what made the significant difference for me because when I would do the prayer and I would do the sujood, when you bow your head down to the floor, it was there that I would release all my tensions and questions and turn them over to God. And it was through that process, it became much more peaceful because as I released the questions, when I would sit back, I would be open in space. My head space would be open. Mm. And then sometimes I would get an, an instantaneous response to my question. And other times I did not, but I was so at inner peace, I could wait. And it made a significant difference because the other faiths, I always felt I was supplicating. God, will you do this? God, how are you gonna have ah. mm-hmm. noise? Nothing but noise. But there it was through this process of prayer that it left me with a lot of inner peace mm, yeah definitely that's that's one of the unique differentiators of islam is is the requirement to pray five times a day in in a unique fashion which you are using the body somewhat similar i, I like to compare it to to it to a not as mobile practice as yoga, but a synergistic kind of synchronicity with your prayer to where you are rising oh, yeah. and, and bowing down your head. So that's, that's interesting. I appreciate you sharing that. Yes. So, so you, you find Islam in China. Yes. And then you progress in, in your studies and you end up in the Middle East for a while as well. Well, two things that happened. Um, the, China, the, the Islam I found in China, the people were very peaceful. They were much more welcoming. They were very intuitive. I was able to communicate with them about a majority of things. We we're looking at a total different philosophy that dealt with Taoism and Buddhism and now Islam and a mixture of all those cultural yeah. things together. So I found it very peaceful. But when I went to the following year, I went to Taiwan for another two and a half years to continue my Chinese studies at um, Taiwan National University. And there in Taipei, there was a Saudi mosque. And it was there where I immediately saw the difference. Um, it was very problematic. And so it was through that process that I was able to see a big difference. And one of the main problems that came was that through this process, um, the mom's son had just been returned from Saudi Arabia. Um, he had been there several times, but had been returned for the third time for having been caught having sex with other guys there. So they sequestered him and really abused him. It was very difficult for him. I could see it on his face, the pain and things of this nature, but there was no language I could do with him at that time that no one else at the mosque knew. So I never had an opportunity to speak to him and tell him, I'm like you. Uh, mm. So it, it, it showed me that that was a very exclusive, non-welcoming aspect of what Islam was versus what I had learned in, in mainland China. 
or in China, um, where they were much more inclusive. Yeah. And so it made a significant difference. So, Imam, in your travels, I mean, you have to be one of the most unique individuals on the planet, man. I mean, I mean, you're, you're an African American man who is a linguist in Arabic and Chinese to where it's, it's an extremely unique combination. And now you have the ability to connect frankly with the majority of the world, knowing Chinese, knowing Islam. I mean that, that alone, we're talking nearly 3 billion people on the planet. Uh, that that study Islam and and that are Chinese speakers. So, can you tell us now? Now, with these skills, what is it that you are doing to fulfill your purpose in life? And and what specific event or events really made that click for you? Well, <laughs> several things um, that led up. Each piece built upon the uh, the next piece. Of course. Okay? Um, after I left China, I went back to Georgetown for nine months, studied Arabic, and then I was immediately thrust into the, the Levine. I was in Cairo a year, Amman for a year, and Damascus for a year. And it was there I had an opportunity to live with a variety of different Muslims. They are both coming from Africa, the Levine, and from Southeast Asia and Asia. So it allowed me an opportunity to meet them in the, the region in which Islam sprung. And it was through that process that I got to understand people and that understood that Islam was very much related to how their culture absorbed the faith. And so it was through that understanding, for example, in Damascus, all the women veiled, no matter what their religion. Mm. So you saw to see how the cultural mixture helped, you know, certain cultural things was for everybody. And it helped me better understand that Islam was not a monolithic type of thing, but it was something, if you looked at it progressively, you could see that it was a immersion of so many different things of different cultures from the region and people coming from other places. So that made a significant difference for me. And so that led me to better understand that there was something different. And after I came back and then started law school, that was when I um, I said, well, what am I going to do in terms of law? I went to a public interest law school and that taught me to, to better understand. I spent two years at Michigan doing my master's and in, in law school there, getting public, you know, um, public policy training as well. And what it wound up doing for me is that it allowed me to say, okay, there's something out here much more important. And that's why I got interested in international public interest law. And which led me eventually to doing some work um, in the Netherlands so many years later for uh, LGBT people who were coming from Muslim countries who were migrating or who were trying to find refugee status in the Netherlands. Mm. And I found one of the problems is that often the UN and those different uh, courts there, they would use a person who spoke the language to be a translator, but those people generally had no training in the law. So they would wind up, you know, giving the people stories that would be very limited, four or five pages worth of material. But I found that because I had the language skills and the law skills, I would talk with these people and learn much more in depth what happened to them. And those four or five, six pages turned into 30, 35 pages of material for them, for the courts to look at. I was able to explain why at 12 years old they threw them down the steps because of the cultural hatred and how it shamed the, the family by the person who was beat up and their arm was broken or the daughter was thrown out of the home you know, and they had to go live with a relative, those kinds of things that was causing disruption in these people's lives because they were uniquely different mm. from the norm. And um, in one particular case, it was the first case they'd ever had a turnaround in less than 24 hours because I was able to explain. This guy, had, he was Iranian and he was on his, his fourth court hearing. And if he didn't pass, they were gonna send him back to Iran, which I knew he would get killed. And so I explained that to them in the, in the brief, but I explained all the different things and it made his six pages of history come alive. And the court agreed and they, they granted him refugee status. So it was that kind of thing and actually started a template that helped a whole lot of others who were going into the Netherlands. So 
the good thing about it is that when I wake up in the morning, I know that my hard work and all of this training and everything helps me save people's lives. Wow. Yeah, because so, you, 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 you literally did that with that case. And I'm sure that must be empowering, especially to see so many people, good people, you know, that, that are doing nothing wrong, that just have a, a different sexual preference than, than uh, you know, a heterosexual person literally being killed. And I'm sure that yes. can that, that can run deep and, and be very empowering to know that your skills can can save their lives. So I'm, I'm curious uh, with progressive Islam, are are you finding much resistance from the more traditional groups as you as you try to include more women and, and obviously being openly gay challenges some beliefs within the faith. How uh, have you seen a lot of resistance? And if so, how are you handling that? Well, the resistance came back in the the actually the end of um, the 1990s. Uh, after I finished law school, I practiced law for a couple of years here in the states, and then I had an opportunity to go to Saudi Arabia to work for the Saudi Royal Air Force and be a teacher there. And that also also offered me an opportunity to go to the university there to study, to continue my Islamic studies. And so through that process, I learned a lot more. Uh, I was always getting in trouble at the school though, <laughs> because I would come in and ask these questions of the professors and many of them didn't know, but they got mad because I would ask the question. But I would always say, I'm here, I'm new, I want to know more and I have the right to ask the question. So one professor in particular, he got angry at me and I told him, says, no, it's not the problem that I, he said, you asked too many questions. And no, it's not that I asked too many questions. The problem is that you think, you know, you, know, you don't have all the answers, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> and he came out of this class and the, you know, the, the dean told me, he says, Dai, I'm, I'm not going to be able to help you much if you keep doing this, <laughs> you know? So I had to calm down, you know, cool it out a little bit. But I learned a lot from it that even there, people were challenged by their culture and they were not allowed or didn't allow themselves to think outside the box. And so you now those were things, you know, there were, I met people who would say that because of Islam, paper was developed. Sorry, but paper was developed in China, you know, that kind mm. of thing. So just common sensical things, they would always associate it to the religion. Well, sorry, that's not how it works. So anyway, um, after leaving there and coming back, that's when I, I got in touch with Faisal Alam in 1999, who started El Fataha uh, Foundation. And it was through them that I got connected with a number of other, a few additional Islamic scholars who were gay and lesbian, and then also starting to meet a broader, sorry, broader community of people. And it was through that process that I got involved in the activism in terms of the LGBT Muslim community. Um, at first it was challenging because people, they, you know, whenever people don't like something, they always want to challenge you and, mm -hmm. you know, we'll kill you and all of that. And I'm like, well then come on with it. Cause I mm -hmm. would tell them, I said, if you think you can do that to me, I said, if you get caught, I'm going to put your ass in jail forever. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I know how to do it as a lawyer. So come on with it, come on with it. Never would turn out to be anything. But it was in 2000 that I started studying with Dr. Taha. And it was there that I started to, um, actually I took over um, a fellow who was in um, Indonesia at the time and started uh, Muslim Gay Men, which was on, on you know, Yo a Yahoo blog group. And I took that over and I was starting studying with Dr. Taha. And it was at that time that I, uh, and leading the group, being the moderator, we had people come in from various places saying it's wrong and this and that, even this group called the straight way, which were reformed gay men from mm. the UK. And they would come up with all these stories and I'm like, no, that's not true. So they say like, well, there's a term used fascia, which means to be an, um, an abomination, mm. for example. And I says, okay, well in the Quran, there's 11 different places where it's used, seven in particular usage. And I went through, using that word in the Quranic text by translating that, because Dr. Taha taught me that you understand the Quran through its themes. Mm -hmm. There are general rules and there are specific rules. 
and most rules are for all of humankind. So I took that word and put it in several places and went verse by verse by verse. And I said, now, does this sound like an abomination? Does it sound like anything about homosexuality? And it didn't. So people were being taught things that people taught them. You know, they were being told these things, but because they didn't do their own research or didn't have the skills yeah. to do their own research and learn, that they were following the cultural understanding, not what the Quran was actually presenting. So, Imam, when, because this is a big issue, you know, in, in Middle Eastern countries, like you said, gay, gay and lesbian people get killed for, for coming out. Are there specific yeah. verses or, or stories in the Quran? So, so what is, what is the, the text that you present when someone tells you the Quran or Islam says that being gay or lesbian is forbidden? What do you present to, to somebody saying that? Well, first of all, the, in the Quran, there are very positive statements about being gay and lesbian in there. And you have to not be so literal to understand it because many parts of the Quran is allegorical. Right, of course. For example, when it talks about spouse, it uses mate, companion, intimate companion, various other ways they relate to a spouse. Mm -hmm. So similarly, um, in uh, Surah 2431, well, actually the thing of marriage, 2430 through 32, talks about marriage. And in 2431, which is the verse that talks about women, the men they don't have to veil before, meaning they're male relatives. And then there it says, and men who have no desire for women. So mm. it's not, you know, it's not rocket science to then say, well, what kind of men would they be interested? What kind of people would they be interested in? Right. It would be males. So then they, and then I would explain, well, there are several types of males who may not have interest in women, but let's look at them. And uh, I said, well, there's older men who may not have interest, but this is before Viagra. You know, they, just <laughs> couldn't get it. they had interest, but they couldn't get it up. <laughs> then I said, you turn to the Thousand and One Nights, um, you know, Thousand and One Nights uh, story tale of the queen and her consorts. Mm -hmm. They had eunuchs who had been castrated. You know, the scrotums had been removed, but they still had apparatuses and they, they had the desire and they were able to handle it. <laughs> and then yeah. you had those who just had no interest. And as a good friend of mine who's a bishop, uh, we used to talk, you know, chat, and he would say, well, uh, what are we supposed to do? Talk about fashion tips if you have no interest in a woman, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the thing is that it's there. But uh, generally speaking, I'll come back to that part 2432 in a moment. But when you go, when they talk about it, they always talk about the loot or the lot story. Right. And I remind them that actually the Lot story, the Luke story actually refers to rape mm. and doing things to people, oppress people, to um, oppress them, to um, abuse them, things of this nature. And I say, whenever you look at the story, the Luke story, it's always talks about the other societies that got destroyed for abuse and for oppression to innocence. Mm. Therefore, that's the real thing behind it. And each one of them did something different. So what was it? It was the abusing of men without consent because it said that there were heterosexual men. These were men who had wives already, had children. So it wasn't homosexual men. Even if you give it that there were some homosexuals up in there enjoying themselves, that was a different story because those were the ones who were abusing people. It was out without consent. Mm -hmm. That's not talking about people who develop relationships and are consensual in their relationship, sexual relationship. I so um, if you jump back to 2432, it has a line in there. And we have to remember a lot of Qurans, they put parathenicals in there. Mm -hmm. So it says, in, like in the use of Ali and also in the, the noble Quran, they put in there, and marry from the single among you, parathenical, male and females, even from your slaves. Well, that is very revealing. One, marry from the single among you. Within Islam, divorce is not a, a shaming thing. It's not a, a taboo. Mm -hmm. If you've been married before and you're now single, you can remarry. No problem. 
Married from the single among you. If you're single, you wish someone single, you get married. They have a, a rule, Zena, you're not supposed to be single and then involved with someone who's already married. It breaks that, that, that contractual union they have. Mm -hmm. Then it says, even if they're male and female, there's a preratinotope to lead you to heterosexuality, the, the heterosexual binary. Mm -hmm. But when you get beyond that, it says, even if it's among your male and female slaves. Well, the issue there is that if you understand Islamic law, the Sharia, that male and female slaves, you could not, an owner could not marry a slave. You're in balance. There's no balance there. So you have to free the slave, then the slave can then be an equal partner to you, and then you can have a contract that says, I want to marry you. Mm. However, in Islamic law, there are several, and there are many cases actually where owners, because of the rule, owned by your right hand, that slave owners, because of the concubinage law, slave owners could have sex with their slaves and no one could say anything about it, be they male or female. It was frowned upon, but it was not against the law. Right, because they're, they're considered your, your property, so you can do whatever you Wow, v very fascinating, Imam, and that's, that's uh, so much depth into Islamic law and just Islam in general that we we may need we may need a part two one of these days. We're we're, we're getting close to the end of our time, ma'am. So I just wanted to to first of all say thank you for the work that you're doing in the world. You truly represent something that Jared and I believe in here with the On Purpose podcast, and encourage our listeners to do, which is question, question things that are brought to you, and continue to seek truth. And something that is so in depth like religion. Uh, specifically Islam and Islamic law that, that you are truly questioning. You are truly helping progress the world for us to get to know each other better in two areas that, especially in the West, need more questioning and need more truth. You know, the LGBT community and the Islamic community, I think that especially here in the West, we have so much to learn. And in that questioning and revealing more truth about each other, that's how we help each other grow. So thank you so much. For the work um, that I you like, do. Before, if you have a moment, I'd just like to say that um, people can look me up and, and follow my institute. It's the Mecca Institute, the Muslim Educational Center for Creative Academics, Mecca yeah. Institute. And we're a think tank that also has a school. And we're, what we're doing is we're training men, women, Muslims, and non-Muslims to understand Islam in an inclusive theological way. And so we encourage people to learn about it and come and study with us because our goal is to, this is my personal goal by the 19, um, what is it, uh, 2030. My goal is to have at least 50 inclusive mosques around the United States in North America. That way people who feel unmosked today mm -hmm. can then find a mosque where they're welcome no matter who they are. Oh, I and love that. Allah, then you know, I used to run a mosque in D.C., and that was something that came. All kinds of people came. Many of them would wanted to have their children raised in a place where they felt comfortable, mm -hmm. that they didn't feel prejudiced. Women were given equal rights. Women could fully participate as well, and so it was something that they really enjoyed. And I want to see that happen for many people because people flourish. People respond yeah how many are we at now inclusive mosques in the united states well there are about five of them from different sources uh -huh. but um, and i'm very happy i mean i participated in many of them there are women mosques in new york city and los angeles there are um, unity mosques with muslims for progressive values one in la i think one in atlanta um, there's another mosque in chicago here in chicago and then in, in toronto there's um Salam, they have a mosque there and one in Vancouver. Gotcha. So they're, you know, mosques around the 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 North America. Gotcha. But I'm, I'm trying to develop a much broader association of mosques so that we have a, a greater centris, you know, central central formulation of what Islam means as an inclusive framework. Yeah, love it. Uh, we appreciate you being here. I definitely learned a lot today and I'll if people want to contact me, it's www.daiee -E at gmail.com. Okay. I mean, gmail, yeah, gmail.com. Yeah. 
and they can reach me personally. That's my personal email address, or they can go to uh, mechainstitute.org and leave a message there and read about our organization and our school as well. Great. We'll, we'll include that in the links to the episode. Yep. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much for joining this us. Note of this Mecca Institute, Mecca hyphen Institute is about the school and then Mecca Institute, all one word. That's about the organization. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time today. You're welcome. I look forward to our next conversation. There's so much more to explore. <laughs> <laughs> always, always. I love, I love the curiosity of hearing people's stories. That's important. All right. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. All right. Take care. Thanks so much. All right, team, as we wrap up another episode of the On Purpose podcast, we are thankful for having you all on our journey. We want to announce new ways to include you and let you go deeper into our community. First off, we've got the onpurposepodcast.com website where you can subscribe to our monthly newsletter, get inside tips, and see what's coming up in the upcoming months. As well as our new launch is our Patreon account. We have five tiers where you can decide at what level you want to contribute to the podcast and the community, help support us, continue to push us forward and grow. And it's as little as 50 cents an episode or $2 a month all the way up to 50 bucks a month depending on and where you want to be. Perks of this are sneak peek uh, episodes. You get the episodes quicker you get to contribute on episodes you get monthly q and a's with ali and i and special guests and you get to be a building block for our community as we continue to grow worldwide with the release of shelly davies episode we are now international and we're excited for the future leads us so please fit in with us wherever you are comfortable and remember team life is far too short to live any other way than on purpose we'll see you next week